going over that cliff. <laughs> Prince of Persia The Sands of Time is an action platformer with a main focus on the manipulation of time itself. <laughs> this game is a masterpiece and I think the games industry owes a lot to this game for actually pushing it forward and in this episode of Greater Height we're going to talk about exactly why. So let's not waste any more time, timestamps are on screen now and also in the description. So spoiler warning from this point onwards guys, alright, let's jump right into it. Our story follows the unnamed prince as deep beneath the ruins of a besieged city he finds an ancient dagger that allows him to reverse time at will. Yeah, it's rewind time. Fucking hell, that's a bit OP, isn't it? Well, well a local vizier who is definitely not evil, honest, <laughs> convinces the prince to place the dagger into another powerful artifact called the Hourglass of Time, releasing the sands of time inside, killing hundreds of thousands of people destroying the entire city. Well, fuck. The game then follows the prince's journey to correct this horrific mistake. Along the way, the prince learns to master using the dagger to reverse time, slays a few demon sand bitches by stabbing them right in the sand ass, oh, me are. and he gets really good at parkour. Parkour, parkour! And conveniently stumbles across a lot of hidden Persian LSD crack dens. Cocaine's a hell of a drug. <laughs> this game's narrative doesn't really do anything groundbreaking, but it just tried to do some interesting things with its main female character when trying to make her a really strong, independent woman who isn't just a generic damsel in distress, but this really all falls apart during gameplay and we'll get to her later. <laughs> well, the narrative may not be groundbreaking, but I truly believe that the gameplay is. I have never played a game first in its series originally released in 2003 that held up so goddamn well. Everything from the animations, soundtrack and set pieces just blew me the fuck away. Prince of Persia is an action platformer with a really strong emphasis on fluid and fast combat and platforming. A lot of this might be considered the norm by today's standards, but I believe that the game industry owes this game a shit ton. There are a lot of similarities between this game and Batman Arkham Asylum, and a lot of praise goes to Arkham Asylum for being the progenitor of cinematic fluid one-button combat, clothes that deteriorate over the hero's journey to show the struggle and progression that character's gone through, and mobs that just fucking sit there and watch you stab their friends to death. Oh no, Dave's being killed! A lot of people say that Batman from 2009 was just copying Assassin's Creed from 2007 in regards to its combat and its fluidity, but Prince of Persia came out all the way back in 2003. But wait, there's more. Both Prince of Persia and Assassin's Creed have the exact same creative director, Patrice Dele... Le Des... Desilet... Fuck. Croissant. Meaning that the sands of time effectively created an entire genre. But wait, there's even more! If we peer even further into Patrice's game development history, we can see that he did this even earlier. All the way back at the turn of the century, he made Donald Duck go in quackers. Look, one button combat, 3D platforming, it was all Donald! The game industry is carried on the back of Donald Duck! Fuck, <laughs> jokes aside, I don't feel like this game is credited enough for how it pushed the industry forward in regards to cinematic focused combat, and not to mention what it did for 3D platforming. Parkour! The cinematic nature of the combat and platforming is so fluid and intuitive, it just makes for such a smooth experience to play. But what really sets this game apart is the Dagger of Time mechanic. Yeah. So this game's unique selling point is that the prince can reverse time itself. He's going over that cliff. Ah! <laughs> this single mechanic changes everything. Without the fear of failure, this means that exploration can have this really fluid and fast feel to it, so you can carry on practicing your parkour skills to impress the boys down the park. Mystery, parkour, parkour. <laughs> this time mechanic isn't just used for platforming, it also extends into the combat as well. Using it in combat, you can freeze enemies in time to chop them in half, rip the sand out of their demon asses to refill your sand vials, freeze time completely, and chop each enemy in half one by one. But fucking finally, reverse time and heal slash prevent the damage you just took. This ability to reverse time to react to the damage you've just taken and then act appropriately to those incoming attacks turns this game's combat into a reaction time memory game, which is just so unique. 
With this mechanic, the game is completely free to not hold the player's hand during gameplay and make the puzzles, platforming challenges and combat incredibly difficult without the fear of the player getting stuck or frustrated, as the player has the tools to repeatedly retry and re-approach each situation that would in other games be considered unfair and annoying. Speaking of unfair and annoying... Ugh. Okay, so throughout the game, the prince allies and travels with the princess Farah. And I have never, never hated an NPC more than this. Don't get me wrong, narratively she's really really good and she has a lot of dimension to her character, but it is during gameplay where this shit gets fucky. Farah turns 80% of this game into a babysitting simulator. Just let me show you a handful of the shit this bitch will put you through. During combat, she stands perfectly still and she gets railed on by enemies and she dies in a few hits, making me repeat each fight repeatedly. And not only this, during combat she fires a bow and arrow to try and help the prince out. Oh, how lovely. Oh, fucking wait. When she fires the shots, they can hit the prince. Why the fuck can they hit me? Oh, when not in combat, she moves incredibly slow and the game pauses to make me watch her climb ladders. Yes, the entire fucking ladder. When not climbing ladders, she's running around getting stuck on terrain where I have to physically push her to her location for the game to even progress. Oh my god, platforming challenges, finally. Something she's not involved in. Oh, I fell and I landed too close to her and now I'm trapped inside a hitbox, forcing me to quit out. Fuck my life. All of this in combination throughout the game just led to me applauding her death rather than being emotionally torn by it. Everything to do with this character during play just frustrated me to no end. I really hope she doesn't appear in the sequels, because she is seriously the only negative I have about this game. But I will be completely fair, as much as I hated Farah, she did help a lot with the diegesis of the game's tutorials. In this section, I'm going to introduce you to diegesis, and as a video game sound designer, the best way I can describe diegesis is through sound itself. When a sound is considered diegetic, it is being produced by something in the game world itself. For example, music being played on a radio inside the game world. Non-diegetic sound would be any sound that does not originate from the game world, such as battle music. The prince himself is not hearing this music, the player is. So if something is diegetic, it's from inside the game world, and if it's non-diegetic, it originates from outside of the game world. Where this shit gets really cool is how diegesis of the game's mechanics can affect player immersion. Diegetic mechanics or game mechanics that link to something inside the game world itself are inherently more immersive, as it does not take the player mentally out of the game world itself. And this is where Prince of Persia, in my opinion, excels the most, at increasing chances for the player to be immersed, because at all moments it tries to keep all hints, hiccups and progression diegetic. For example, to heal himself, the prince drinks water, and not just from these predefined water fountains, but he can also drink from any body of water. If the player thinks to try this, further increasing the diegesis of this mechanic. This is fucking awesome. During platforming, the game uses shadows to signify diegetically when you need to jump, and during puzzles, instead of giving hints to the player by popping up an immersion-breaking user interface element on the screen, the prince and princess talk to one another and to themselves to hint at what to do. I wonder what this is for. This is a beautiful way of providing diegetic hints that feel natural. During combat, other UI elements such as enemy health bars are avoided by enemy health being indicated by how much sand is pouring out of their bodies, keeping the user interface to a bare minimum. Look at Dead Space for an example of a user interface being 100% diegetic. Oh, oh my god, it's fucking beautiful. These things might be subtle and go unnoticed by most players, but they really add up to keep the player as immersed as possible. If all of the elements we are interacting with fit and make sense inside the game world, it is feasible to consider that it will be easier for the player to stay immersed in the game world. And Prince of Persia is a wonderful example of this being done beautifully all the way back in 2003. A fuck yes, Prince of Persia. A fuck yes. So guys, after all of this, what is my final verdict for Prince of Persia The Sands of Time overall? Well, for me, this game is simply great. Although babysitting Farah made me want to rip my own f***ing eyes out, the fluidity of the platforming and combat somehow made playing this game challenging and effortless at the same time. I've never been more excited to cover the sequel to a game more than this. 
to see if it can follow up on this masterpiece and possibly bin off the barrow. <laughs> well, I guess we'll find out in a future episode. Thank you so much for watching, mate. It really means the world to me. And if you enjoyed this episode, why not drop it a like and share it with some friends to help me out? On the next episode of Great or Hate, we're going to be taking a look at Bioshock 2. Oh, fuck, wish me luck. <laughs> and then after that, it's back to the timey-wimey bullshit with Prince of Persia Warrior within. I am stupidly hyped to cover the sequel, as I have incredibly fond memories of this game from my childhood, but I was never actually able to play Warrior Within, so I am stupidly excited. If you want more of my combination of stupid humour and game development analysis, a new episode of Greater Hate releases every two weeks, and I stream every Tuesday and Friday at twitch.tv slash itsjermaine. I hope to see you there. Thank you so much for the support, mate. I'll see you in the next one.